Okay, so now we, we resume the session with the next invited speakers, Professor Jean Lasserre. Professor Lasserre is Director of Research the Research at the Laboratoire d'Analyse et Architecture des Systèmes of the CNRS France. And he's also associated with the Institute of Mathematics in Toulouse. And today he's talking about the moment SOS hierarchy. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. And I want to thank the organizers. It's a, it's a great honor to speak in this conference. So I will briefly describe the, what the moment SOS hierarchy is. Uh, originally developed for uh, solving global optimization problems. But I will try to convince you that this uh, methodology is far more general and can be applied to solve uh, several problems outside optimization. So the, the material uh, that I use in this talk is, uh, you can find more details in these books, this one also and this one. So it's, uh, this one is, has different chapters on semi-algebraic geometry and optimization. And I would start by saying, why should we consider polynomial optimization as a specific case? And then I will present what are called the LP and SDP certificates of positivity. And then the moment LP and moment SOS approaches. And some, as I said, I would try to insist on application, applications outside optimization where this methodology can be applied. So let's start by considering the polynomial optimization problem or you want to minimize uh, function f of x under some constraint g of x non negative, finite dimensional. Okay, and we assume here that the uh, polynomial f, f and gj are polynomials. And uh, well, why should we uh, focus on this particular case? Because after all, this is just a particular case of nonlinear programming. And uh, we, so this problem can be defined with more general classes of functions. And it's true that we, if we are only interested in local optimum, then the fact that f and gj are polynomial does not help very much. But for global optimization, the picture is different. Remember that for uh, the defi one definition of a global optimum, f star is, is the same as saying that you want to compute a scalar lambda, which is a maximum lambda, such that f of x minus lambda is non-negative for all x in, in k and see already that this definition does not apply for local minimum. So this definition is really uh, true for global optimum. And so if you would like to compute this F star, then you would need to handle efficiently uh, the constraint that F of x minus lambda is non negative for all x in k, and you should handle this in an efficient manner. Otherwise, you cannot solve the problem. And of course, if I give you a lambda, a scalar lambda, checking that this is true for all x in k is a difficult problem in general. And we would like to have tractable certificates of positivity on k. So I give you a lambda, and you will be able to check whether f of x minus lambda is non negative on k. So in general, as I said, if f is not a polynomial and k is an arbitrary set, this is a, a, a very hard task. Now, the fact that f and gj are polynomial now helps because we can use powerful certificate of positivity which exist and come from a real algebraic geometry. And not only they have, there are theorems in mathematics in this branch of mathematics, but also such certificates of positivity, I will present in a minute, are also interesting because they are amenable to practical computation. You could define uh, a stronger positivity of uh, uh, certificate of positivity for a larger class of functions, for example, analytic function, but for practical application, you would not know how to use them to develop practical algorithms. So the compromise being working with polynomial and semi-algebraic set is a good compromise. It's not, you don't consider the more general case, but it, it, com it encompasses enough problems to be interesting. So what is this uh, uh, first type of certificate, which is a sum of square base certificate. And uh, every time I present this talk, I, I, I think that if you have to remember something of my talk, this will be this slide. And uh, I like this theorem because we'll see, uh, I think it's very rare in mathematics that you have a, 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 a theorem that a freshman at university can understand. And it's still very powerful and not trivial. 
So you start by uh, having a set K of Rn, defined by finitely many polynomial inequalities, you, and you assume that K is compact, and in addition, to simplify things, since it is compact, it is contained in a ball of radius m, for some big m, and you assume that you put this, this constraint, which is redundant, you put this constraint in the definition of k. It's just a technical, uh, to avoid technicalities. So what is this theorem? This theorem is the following, it's due to Putinar in 1993, it says the following. If f is a positive polynomial, a polynomial which is strictly positive on k, then there is a way to write f in a certain way that you see immediately that why it is positive. So you can write f in the following way. You can write f as a linear combination of the gj that defines the set k times a weight. This weight is a polynomial which is a sum of square, so it's always non-negative, plus another sum of square. So of course when x is positive, if f can be written like this, you immediately see that f is positive on k, you don't have to, to do any calculation, you just see that when x is in k, this, this term is positive, you multiply it with a positive term, and you add up another positive term, so f of x is obviously positive, right? So the strength of the theorem is that if f is strictly positive on k, indeed you can write f like this. So don't tell me that this, this theorem is difficult. I mean, a freshman at university can understand this theorem. The proof is far, far from being trivial, but the statement is very, very easy to understand. Uh, in this theorem of Fortinard, nothing is said on the degree of the SOS polynomial. What do I mean by that? Suppose, for example, that the GJ are quadratic, degree two polynomials. F is also quadratic, for example, and you want to see if a quadratic polynomial is no negative on the intersection of ellipsoid or quadratic uh, constraints, then it may happen that if f is strictly positive on k, then to, have, to, to obtain the certificate of positivity, you might need to have some weights of degree maybe 1,000. Because after there is a sum here, so when you develop this polynomial in the basis of monomials, of course it is equal to f, so all terms of degree higher than 2 vanish. But to get this, this, vanished, this vanishment, then you, you have to do cancellation, and maybe sigma j are terms of degree 1,000, but they vanish when you do the summation, okay? But the good news, if you would like to test if a polynomial uh, uh, f is positive on k, then you could try to, so, to, 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 to test this with imposing a degree on the weight. So you have f, the dj, and then you try to write f like this, and you say, okay, I want to write f like this, and I impose a degree, a maximum degree on the, on, on the weights sigma j. For example, sigma j degree of sigma j less than 10, for example. Once you do that, testing if this is true is just solving an SDP. So for those who don't know what is an SDP, I'll just briefly say that SDP, semi-definite programming, is a, is a subclass of convex optimization problems that can be solved efficiently. So I, don't, I won't give more details, but saying that when you say that it is solving an SDP, then in principle you can solve this problem efficiently. So that's why this certificate is interesting, because checking what F satisfies this with a degree bound on the weights is just solving an SDP. Okay? Now, this theorem comes with two facets, one algebraic facet, the one I just presented, and a dual facet, which is related to a functional analysis, and is related to the, the so-called k-moment problem. So with the same set k as we have seen before, now I give you a real sequence of number, indexed by alpha, alpha is a multi-index, okay, here. So you have a bunch of scatters, indexed like this, and the question is, Given these numbers, can you, write, can you say if this number is the moment alpha of some measure mu that you don't know, supported on k? So this is a, called the k-moment problem. I give you those number. Can you say yes or no if you can write y alpha as the moment alpha of some measure mu on k? If this is true, then you have a, y is said to have a representing measure. So this is an old problem that dates back to the early uh, 19th century, 20th century, sorry. Okay, and the dual facet of Putin R theorem is the following. So you start with the same set K as before, okay? 
And the dual side of Putin theorem says the following. Given a sequence of number y index like this, then this sequence has a representing measure supported on k if and only if some collection of matrices, grid matrices, will be positive semi-definite. So there will be two kinds of matrices, one which is called the moment matrix. So all these matrices are real symmetric. They are linear in the y. So each entry of these matrices are linear in the y. I don't give the way it is written, but it's not important for the, for, for the, uh, for the sequel. So you have a bunch of matrices indexed by D. So D will fix the size of this matrix. The higher D, the, high, the higher the size of this matrix. And you, for all D, those real matrices just formed by the entries, all entries formed by a linear combination of the Y should be positive semi-definite. So the, as I said, the real symmetric matrix M, MD, so it's a D here, sorry, is called the moment matrix associated with the sequence Y. And the real symmetric matrix MD of GY is called the localizing matrix associated with the sequence Y. So notice that in this theorem, if those matrices are positive semi-definite, then you know that there exists a measure, but nowhere in the, in, the, in the theorem you see the measure mu appearing. So this is quite remarkable that you obtain only condition on the, on the numbers y by checking some uh, eigenvalues of, of some matrices, and it will tell you that y comes from some measure. And the measure mu can be very complicated, so support can be nasty, but you have a, an if and only if condition that depends only on, the, on your numbers through those matrices. Okay. okay, as I said, those necessary conditions are stated only in terms of countably many LMI conditions, linear matrix inequality condition on the sequence Y. So in this theorem of Putinar, you have two facets. As I said, the, 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 an algebraic side, which is related to the question of positivity on K. How, characterized, how can you characterize those polynomial F, which are positive on K? Okay. It has a dual side, which is in a functional analysis part of mathematics. It's related to the k-moment problem. So with the same set k, now you are given a sequence of numbers, and then you would like to see if those numbers come from some measure mu supported on k. And the duality between these two uh, facets are given by this, this just uh, duality bracket with a polynomial f and a sequence y, is given by this uh, bilinear form. There is also another algebraic positivity certificate due to Krivin, Vasilis, Kuhn, and uh, I don't present here, uh, but unfortunately, less powerful and with some drawbacks. And in fact, uh, as I, this will be the uh, introduction for uh, describing some application outside optimization. Uh, non negative polynomials on a set K are everywhere, and uh, they appear in many important applications outside optimization. We will see some of them. And provided that you model this application as a particular instance of what is called the generalized moment problem. And this, uh, this appears in, uh, in a lot, a lot of uh, 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 domains. So what is a generalized moment problem? It's one line to state. It's, a, it's, a linear, it's an infinite dimensional linear programming problem. The unknowns are measures. So everything in red is unknown, and in blue is the data. So you, you look for some measures, mu i, whose support depends on uh, i, so, and, and the space could depend on i also. So you look for some measure, mu i, so you want to minimize some uh, linear functional on those measures, or some given function f i, and some linear constraints on those measures. So it's one line to state, but it's amazing uh, how many applications are behind, because all the uh, complexity of the problems that can be described like this is hidden in the set Ki. Okay. So it's a linear, infinite dimensional linear programming problem. If you take the dual, like you do in linear programming, you get that you have dual variables associated with the constraints. And in the dual, you, you try to maximize this linear functional under the constraint that some function, fi minus sigma of lambda j h i j, is positive on Ki. So again, you see that you have a, a positivity constraint on some set in the dual. Okay? So I, I, I want just to show you that global optimization is the simplest example of the GMP. 
So we will see some other more sophisticated example, but global optimization is, 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 is one line to show that it's the simplest example of the generalized moment problem. So F star, as I said, is a minimum of F on X and K, okay? But just, you can write this like this. F star is a global minimum. It can be written also as you look for a measure of mu on K, which is a probability measure, and that minimizes FD mu. So it's, you can do simplest example of GMP. One constraint, one measure, and one linear criterion, right? Why is it true? Because if f of x is greater than f star for all x in k, and mu is a priority measure, then the minimum of this is greater than f star. And if you take every x in k, you take the Dirac measure at the, at the point x, it gives you also fd mu equal f of x. So those two problems are completely equivalent. And this is just a GMP, but the simplest example. So what are the uh, moment LP and moment S sum of square approach? It's very simple. It consists of using a certain type of positivity certificate. For the moment LP approach, you use the Krivin, Vasil, Skuandelman that I did not present. And the moment SOS approach is just using the Potinar certificate, right? In potentially any application where such a characterization is needed. And we will see many, many of them. And global optimization is ju just only one example. In such situation, it amounts to solving a hierarchy of linear programs if you, if you use this certificate, or semi-definite programs if you use put in our certificate. And the size, you have a hierarchy because you try to solve SDP of increasing size, depending on the parameter D in put in our certificate. So just give you uh, the, the flavor of what it looks like for optimization. Very simple. Remember that your global optimum F star is given by this, and you don't know how to handle these difficult constraints. So what you do is you replace these positivity constraints by a positivity certificate. So you fix a D, the index of a hierarchy. You fix a D, and then you say, okay, I don't know how to handle these constraints. Now I am more demanding. I want this polynomial F minus lambda to be not only negative on K, but also to have a certain put in our representation. So I am more demanding where the weights are, where the, the degree of the weights are bounded by D, okay? So I'm, I'm more demanding here than here. So the soup is smaller. So this guy is a lower bound on F star. And this is solving an SDP. So when you, try, when you fix D and you solve this, this is just a convex optimization problem that can be solved efficiently. That's the ID, okay? And this is the SDP associated with the algebraic facet of Putinar's theorem. And this SDP, it's a convex optimization problem, a conic one. It has a dual, and the dual, which I don't present here, is, a, is an SDP on moment, the dual side, and it's associated with the k-moment facet of Putinar's theorem, which is not surprising. So duality in convex optimization captures the algebraic facet of Putinar's theorem and the uh, moment facet of Putinar's theorem. So, and now the, the main result is the following, that when D, so for, for each D you fix D, then you have a certain SDP of certain size to solve. And when D goes to infinity, then you recover the global optimum, okay? But, uh, but moreover and importantly, the, the generically, the moment SOS hierarchy has finite convergence. So you don't, know, you don't need to go to infinity, you stop at a finite D. And also there is a sufficient rank condition on the moment matrix at the optimal solution of the dual, which also all generically, which permit to test whether F star equal F star D. So at each step D, you, you solve your SDP and you have a, a, a rank condition to test, which tells you if you are at the global optimum or if you need to go to a higher D. What makes this approach exciting is that it's at the crossroad of several disciplines and applications, and it goes to commutative, non-commutative, and nonlinear algebra. Actually, there is a non-commutative uh, version of this hierarchy for quantum uh, computing. Also, uh, it's related to a real algebra, geometry, and functional analysis, the two facets, algebraic facet and the moment facet, optimization in convex analysis, and computational complexity in computer science, which benefits of all of this interaction. And as I mentioned already, potential applications are endless. I will try to give you a flavor of some applications. 
has already been proved useful and successful in application with modest problem size, notably in optimization, control with control optimal control estimation, computer vision. And if sparsity uh, is present, then you can solve problem of much larger size. And as initiated and simu stimulated new research issue in convex algebraic geometry, computational algebra for solving polynomial equations without computing complex solutions, and computational complexity in computer science, while the LP and SDP hierarchy now uh, are view at the uh, basic tool for, to prove or disprove the uh, Cotes unique games conjecture. So recall that both LP and SDP hierarchy are general purpose method, not tailored to specific art problems. And uh, the SOS hierarchy has a remarkable pro several remarkable properties that, that is not true for the LP hierarchy. Uh, when you solve this optimization problem with F and GJ polynomial, you, don't, you just give the definition of your problem, and you don't try to distinguish between convex, continuous, non-convex, or zero-one problems. For example, if you have a Boolean variable, you just model this as, as an equality constraint, xi squared minus xy equals zero. So in traditional nonlinear programming problems, that would be stupid to do that. If you open a book on, 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 on uh, local optimization, if you have a Boolean constraint, then you are in a, in a framework of discrete optimization or mixed integer optimization, and you have a special kind of algorithm. If you have a convex problem, you go to some kind of algorithm. If you have a continuous non-convex problem, you also have some other types of algorithm. And here, you don't try to specialize uh, your, uh, your tool, okay? And then you might say, okay, but this is just too general. Your tool is too general. So it, it, it does not distinguish between those classes of problem. So it might not be very efficient. And even so, this moment SOS approach does not specialize to each class of problems. For example, if you input a convex problem without telling the software that it is convex, it stops at the first iteration for the class of SOS convex problems. And if it's convex, then you stop in infinitely many steps. And if it is non-convex, you stop infinitely many steps generically. Okay? Which, and this, this is not true for the LP hierarchy, unfortunately. Also, now, if you go at the, the, at the other end of the spectrum for difficult zero-one uh, out discrete optimization problem, then it still dominates all lift and project hierarchies, mean, meaning it provides the best lower bounds for a large class of combinatorial optimization problems. And this is why the, the computer science community talks about the meta-algorithm, because it's the, gem, the same general algorithm for several class of combinatorial optimization problem, and it still provides the best lower bounds. The no free lunch rule is the size of the DP relaxation grows rapidly with the original problem size. For example, if your original problem has n variable, then at step D of a hierarchy, you have this amount of variables, which is quite big, okay? And matrix size of, so you have really symmetric matrices that should be positive semi-definite of this size. Okay, so in the, in the, in the way I presented it, uh, this is only possible for small d and modest n. Okay, so how, to, how would you handle larger size problems? Then the first idea is to, to also exploit symmetries which are present when you have a large size problem, usually you have some structure that you can exploit. And this is done by very uh, talented people, uh, that the names are here, and they, they yield uh, extremely good results in combinatorial optimization, encoding and packing. In particular, work by Valentin gave uh, the best bound known in, in some coding problem and packing problem but they use symmetries to be able to solve the resulting SDP. Or another possibility is to exploit sparsity in the data, because in general, when you have a large size problem uh, and you take a particular constraint, it's very often the case that each particular constraint involves a small number of variables. You could have 1,000 variables, but if you pick up one particular constraint, it usually links a few number of variables, let's say five, six, I don't know, not, not many. And using this property, you can yield the sparse variant of the SOS hierarchy I just presented. And you still preserve the convergence to the global optimum and finite convergence for the class of convex problem. But you can now s solve sparse non-convex quadratic problems with, for example, more than 2,000 variables. With the, the hierarchy I just presented at the beginning, it would be impossible to, to even implement the first step. But when you use this sparsity, you can indeed solve uh, 
potentially large size problem, non-convex large size problem. But you need this sparsity. And there are also some attempts to define some more economic positivity certificates. I don't go into details. And now I'm, I'm going to talk about applications a little bit. Uh, first application outside optimization is optimal control and nonlinear hyperbolic PDEs. So for optimal control, you usually have a dynamical system given by, uh, by ordinary differential equations. Your control is, uh, U is a control on which you can uh, modify the criterion. So you want to play on U to minimize this linear functional. And uh, you have set constraint on X and uh, constraint on U, okay? And uh, those problems are hard to solve, and particularly when you have state constraints, okay? And the idea is to use the concept of occupation measures, where there is a weak formulation of optimal, optimal control problem that can be posed as an infinite dimensional linear program on a space of measure, so-called occupation measures. So I don't go into details. And of course, this weak formulation is exactly an instance of the generalized problem of moments. And under some conditions, the optimal values of this optimal control problem and its LP, this generalized problem of moments in the weak formulation, are the same. You don't lose anything in going to this uh, relaxation. So when the vector field F of the uh, ordinary differential equation is a polynomial, and the set X and U are compact basic semi-algebraic set, then you can apply the machinery of the moment SOS hierarchy to approximate the optimal value as closely as desired by, doing, by solving SDP of increasing size. So I don't go into details. Indeed, the hierarchy of semi-definite programs of increasing size whose associated monotone sequence of optimal value converges to the optimal value of the optimal control problem. And the, the, the thing about this is to avoid the discretization of time. Okay. The same approach, using this a weak formulation and an occupation measure, works also for measure-valued solution for weak formulation of certain nonlinear hyperbolic PDEs, like for example the Burgers equation. Okay. And by doing the, so I don't go into detail, but you have a weak formulation of this problem, which involves, a, which is a linear uh, programming problem on an infinite dimensional LP on a space of measures, like for the OCP. And you can apply the machinery I presented for the uh, generalized um, one problem. And again, this avoids the discretization of, of the time x domain. And we have a very recent work where uh, uh, the results for the Burger equation are, are very good. Extension and related work in this area. So this also allows to compute Lepinov function uh, of the polynomial Lepinov function of degree 4, 5, 6. Usually people do it for quadratic Lepinov function. You can also use this uh, hierarchy, as moment SOS hierarchy, to approximate regions of attraction uh, by sets of the form sublevel set of some polynomial. And convex optimization of nonlinear feedback controller also, and that's been contributed by many authors in control. Uh, they can also be used for estimation problems, as seen as min max optimization, robust stability, and probability destability analysis detection of anomalies and causal interaction in video sequences, big data, in particular the work of Piga, Rigruto, and Snyder. Inverse optimal control, so I won't say much about this, but uh, uh, this is a problem of, op uh, of, op of optimal control where, in fact, you record, you don't know the criterion you want to minimize, so you have some trajectories in the database that you have observed, like think about uh, humanoid robotics, and the idea is from this data knowledge of uh, uh, trajectories made by a robot to open a door, for example, for, to do a precise task, you would like to know if when the robot is doing this, it minimizes some criterion. So it's an inverse problem. Given your system and some trajectories in your database, can you infer the Lagrangian that this, is, this uh, human or robot is minimizing? So this is also possible using, I, I don't go into details. Um, Approximation of sets with quantifier, also, that's another application where you have two sets of variables and you have a set K like this. This is typically what happens in robust control. You would like to handle sets of this form where you want to be, <coughs> you want to find, for example, uh, you want to manipulate set of this form where X in a box so that this polynomial is negative for all Y uh, so that X, Y belongs to K. 
And one way to do that is to approximate this set by level set of some polynomial degree k. Okay? And we can do that by using the moment SOS R key. And this approximation is good in the sense that you can define by using the moment SOS R key. You can construct polynomial of degree 2k so that this set is contained in the set you want to characterize. And the difference of the volume in the set goes to zero. So you approximate your set as closely as desired in the sense of Lebesgue measure. Convex underestimator of polynomials, uh, which is used in the context of mean integer, mixed integer nonlinear priming problem. Uh, so in this case, you have a, uh, you want to, uh, your, your f is, is a non-convex polynomial, which is a sum of a uh, 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 great number of some other polynomial of, uh, with some, some small number of variables. Okay. And the idea is a branch and bound of mean integer, mean integer nonlinear programming problem is to compute, in, in the branch and bound, you want to compute efficiently lower bounds. And you, for this, you compute a, a, a convex relaxation of your problem to be able to compute lower bound efficiently. So computing under, you want, given fk, you want to compute a, a convex underestimator and a convex underestimator for gj. And these are, you have many of them, but they are low dimensional. So the, the generic problem is to, is to compute a tight convex polynomial underestimator of a non-convex polynomial on a box. And the take-home message is that good convex polynomial underestimator can be computed efficiently by using this machinery. The idea is that you have two types of constraints that P should be, you look for polynomial P which is convex, should be dominated by F, a non-negativity constraint, and it should be convex on B. And this is again a non-negativity constraint. I say the Asian, times u on, on the unit ball should be positive for all x in u. So convexity and domination by f are two positivity constraints. So the idea is to use positivity certificates to, to do this. Sorry. Now I come to two other types of uh, applications which are already different. Super resolution, for example, uh, here in this case, you, have a, uh, you start from, a, this is a signal processing application. You start from an unknown sign measure phi star, your signal. And you know that it is supported on finitely many atoms, uh, uh, and few of them. Sometimes they are corrupted by noise. So you have a, an unknown, you have a signal that you observe, and it is of, you know it is of this form, but you don't, you don't know the gamma k and the, and the atoms. And the only thing that you know is that you know some uh, information on your signal, you know some moments, okay? So your, this is your signal, and the only thing you know about this signal is those, this uh, uh, observation, and you know it is a sparse signal. So the idea from the knowledge of the Q alpha, for some alpha, finitely many, you want to retrieve the gamma k and the delta and the xk. And the idea is to use this, uh, as to do with a, a compression sync talk by Donoho, but in the case of signal processing, this is just minimizing the total variation of your measure phi. So you look for a measure phi, sign measure, so that this phi should satisfy this constraint, the measurements, right? And you want to minimize the total variation of phi. And when you do that, phi is supported on interval or on the torus. It's a one-dimensional signal. Uh, and the, the, the nice contribution of Candes and Fernandez Granda was to prove that uh, if the distance between the two atoms, between any two atoms of your signal is sufficiently large, so they have to be separated, and you have sufficiently many moments, sufficiently, sufficiently many observations, then the, 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 the nice result by Kenneth and Granda is to say that this infinite dimensional LP has a unique solution. There is a unique phi, which is exactly the one you look for, which is solution of this infinite dimensional LP. And in the case of a one dimensional signal, it's just solving, uh, solving this is just solving a single SDP. That was a seminal paper by Candes. And the idea is uh, for a side measure, you, you, you write your phi as a difference of two positive measures. So the total variation now becomes the sum of the mass of the two. And your measurement condition given, since phi is equal to phi plus minus phi, uh, it's phi minus here, sorry minus here. 
Okay, this is a, this is an instance of the GMP, so you can use this even in the uh, multivariate problem. And this is what we have done for the uh, uh, multivariate extension of solid by Candace and Kanda. Sparse polynomial interpolation. Uh, it's very nice, a very simple observation that suppose now in interpolation you have a, a black box. You know the black box is a polynomial, but you don't know the polynomial. The only thing you can know you know about this polynomial is that if you give an input, an arbitrary point, you can evaluate by this polynomial p your uh, point p of z k, but you don't know p. So you have you fix z, you send it to the black box. The output gives you the value of p of z k, z k, sorry. And the, the problem is that you want to retrieve p from a, a few evaluations. Okay. And the idea is to show that this, if p is a sparse polynomial, which has a, a small number of coefficients, then in fact few evaluations are needed. And the message that p can be considered as a sign Borel measure, atomic, on the n torus. And retrieving p from a few evaluations is exactly a super resolution problem, exactly of the same vein we have seen in the previous slides. How does it work? It's, it's very easy. Suppose I fix a, uh, the idea is very simple. P is a non polynomial. So fix a z0 on the torus, an arbitrary point on the torus, okay? And then evaluate P at some power of z0. What do you get? So by definition of P, this is equal to sigma of P alpha. Remember that P is unknown, so, but it's written like this, so sigma of P alpha, z0 alpha to the power beta, okay? Uh, so z0 beta to the power alpha. And then the idea is, is just like in Fubini integration, you interchange the two integra integral, so you can interchange beta and alpha here. And when you write it like this, you observe that this is just equal to sigma of p alpha, and this term is equal to z beta integration with the Dirac at this, po at this, at this point. Okay, and this is equal to z beta, and this is a measure mu supported on finitely many atoms, which are the z0 to the power alpha. So in other words, when you evaluate p at successive power of z0, well, z0 is a point on the torus, you are just evaluating the moment beta of this measure. And this measure has co the, the, the coefficient of this measure as the coefficient of your unknown polynomial, and, this, and, the, and the atoms give you the monomials, the, the monomials, okay? So again, if you want to retrieve Therefore, if you were given an arbitrary fix zero on the torus, every polynomial p can be viewed as a sign Borel measure mu on the torus, okay? With finite support z0 alpha, which are the atoms, and the weights are the coefficient of your polynomial. So given evaluations, retrieving p is just, uh, the evaluation is just the moment beta of mu. So if you want to retrieve your polynomial, is exactly like in super resolution, you have some measurements, you have a measure on the torus, and you want to retrieve your measure from sufficiently many evaluations. Okay? So just to give you a, how this can, can be powerful sometimes, just first in the one variable, univariate case, suppose you have a polynomial with three coefficients only, a degree 80, okay? And it has only three monomials out of potentially 80. And so, for example, you choose z0 on, uh, on the torus, like this one, for example. And then, your, as I said, your super resolution problem is to find a measure mu on the torus with three atoms out of potentially three, 101. And your exact result is obtained with four evaluations. Hence, we solve an SDP with matrices, topis matrices of size four by four. So, for example, when you do this, your polynomial on the torus, when you fix the zero here, then your three atoms are here, here, and then one negative here, because you have two positive coefficients and one negative. So you have, here you have a, the two positive one and the negative one, okay? And you just solve an SDP with three, four by four matrices, a single SDP. Uh, now, tensor decomposition. Exactly the same kind of problems. Suppose you have a cubic tensor, and you want to find this, uh, 
is a one rank decomposition. Okay? So A is your, your, you know your coefficient of your tensor, and you want to recover its decomposition of rank one. Okay? But again, this is exactly the same as seeing A being, uh, uh, okay, a being a combination of Dirac at those points with weight lambda i. So again, you look for a measure mu on the sphere now, okay? And ai, the coefficient of a tensor, as seen as moments of this measure. So you are given some moments of some unknown measure on the sphere, and you want to retrieve the measure. And this will give you the decomposition of the, the tensor decomposition. Okay, so given A, your tensor, recovery of the decomposition of A of, uh, by the moment this approach uh, was done by a paper of Teng and Chai in 2015 and Potashin And again, it's a super resolution problem. You have some measurements which can be viewed as moment of some unknown measure on a certain domain. For signal processing, uh, super resolution is on the torus, usually on an interval. For tensor, it's on the sphere. And for polynomial interpolation, it was also on the multi-torus, okay? But again, the same idea. Some measurements of your unknown object, the idea is to view them as some moments of some measure supported on, on, on some domain. And this measure is atomic because you have a finite decomposition. And the idea, how to retrieve this decomposition from the knowledge of the moments, you minimize the total variation norm, which is like in compression sensing, minimizing the L1 norm, and you, under some condition of separation, you find your exact decomposition. Optimal, uh, optimal design in statistics. Uh, when you design experiment, you model the response uh, uh, of a random experiment whose inputs are represented by a vector ti with respect to some non-regression function, in case will be polynomials. So, okay, so you do experiment on ti, so the ti are fixed. You observe the output, and you would like to recover the polynomial of your regression, okay, with some noise. This is a typical problem in statistics. And the idea to do so efficiently, the people try to find what are the best point ti to choose so that some, some uh, variance is minimized, okay? The goal is to find appropriate point ti in a certain set which is given, and the frequency associated with each point means the, the number of times you will choose this point to do your experiment, okay? So you have potentially many points, and you choose each of them with so a certain frequency, okay? And this is called uh, a design. And to find the best design, you form this information matrix, okay? And finding the best design is to minimize some statistical criterion on, on f of this matrix, okay? Typically, for example, the, 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 the D optimal design is when you take as F the log depth of your, of your matrix. Okay? So usually you end up with a convex optimization problem after some discretization of the design space. So the idea is, in the moment of approach to this problem, you do not discretize X, and you rather search for an atomic priority measure on X. Again, you see, you will have some information, and you, 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 the, the object that you want to retrieve, you, 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 you see it as a measure an atomic measure on some domain, okay? So your measure mu that you don't know would be of the, is atomic, so it's a linear combination of Dirac, and you don't know where the atoms are. And the idea is you want to, so you have your information matrix, so you would like to maximize log depth of this information matrix under the fact that mu is a priority measure on supported on X, okay? When you do that, you completely avoid the discretization of your design space X, okay? And this, this works remarkably well for uh, a lot of uh, uh, domain, okay, provided the, uh, the f regression function are polynomials. And for example, a typical example in the literature, we take this kind of domain. And for example, if you take a polynomial of degree up to three, cubic regression, then for, for this domain, this is, our, this is where the, you find the point. So you see, you don't have to discretize this domain and you're, you find an atomic measure which support on this point, and they are exactly the optimal one that you can find by other methods using heavy discretization. For the sphere, it gives you this. This is a, for degree d equals three, you find all the points. That's the point that you should choose on your sphere to do, that's the best point for you doing your experiments, your random experiments, because they minimize some 
statistical property of your information matrix. So I will end up with this uh, LP of space of measure, which is a rich framework. So generally, it's, it's a general pro problem of moments, but it's, uh, in this case, it's very simple. You have only one measure. So you, have a, you look for a measure of phi, some, some cons one linear functional, some domi possibly domination constraints, mu is given, and some moment constraints. So this is a very general framework. And this, this framework can be used to compute sharp bounds on mu of k given some moments of mu. This is a typical problem in, 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 uh, in uh, probability. To also approximate as closely as desired from below and above the Lebesgue volume of k, or the Gaussian measure of k, for possibly non-compact k. So k doesn't need to be convex. Also, it can be used to model change constraints. So if you have a constraint of the form, you have a noise omega, and then you have a set x, so you should look for the set x so that some probability of violation or satisfaction of a constraint should be greater than 1 minus epsilon. So this, this is a, called a change constraints. You can approximate such difficult sets by a, a sublevel set of some polynomial, and you, this approximation can be arbitrarily close. And more. For example, you can also do, uh, uh, um, well, I don't know some details here, you, you find some details, but uh, I claim that this, this framework is quite general and, and very, uh, very helpful in many, many problems in probability, statistics, and operation research. In fact, as I said at the beginning, the list of potential applications is uh, of the generalized moment of problem a uh, general problem of women, sorry, is almost endless. And uh, there was already a book written in uh, uh, 1987 by several uh, leaders in different fields, operator theory, probability, statistics, um, geometry, computational geometry. And they already, at the time, they were already describing a lot of application of the generalized problem of moments. But at the time this book was written, putin R theorem did not exist, so they didn't know how to solve it. And I claim that with putin R theorem and the moment SOS hierarchy, there is a way to try to solve problems if the size is not too big, of course, and if the size is large, if there is some sparsity, then you can also use it. This is uh, the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lassen, for this, this lovely talk. Are there questions or remarks? Please. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. With this wide range of applications. Uh, it's the first, uh, first application on the control problem. Do you need any uh, conditions on the state constraint? Or uh, no, does, uh, any state at all? There is a convex... Con the, the second uh, question, do you have any application on image processing? We have not tried uh, image processing applications, but uh, it's an inverse problem, yes. I think some people have used the moment, the formulation of uh, image processing by moments, but I don't know if it works well. Uh, that I have no experience on that. For the control problem, here, when you have the weak formulation of this problem, to be completely equivalent to the original formulation, you need some constraints, some, some condition, some convexity condition on the H, and it's related to, to the, the state X also, the constraint on the state X. There are some conditions. They were given by Winter, Richard Winter. And about the weak formulation, do you Wait. do any a posteriori analysis at all? Or no, it's just, you, you just integrate on... You just integrate test functions which are polynomial on the domain. That's it. Thank you for this talk. Uh, suppose you have a continuous optimization problem and you have a difficult constraint that you are approaching by this uh, uh, mechanism. What happens with the multipliers? Do you have some uh, analysis of uh, yeah, well, respect to original Yes. Problem? So when you do the SDP relaxation for your optimization problem uh, and you stop at the step D, you will have something like that. F minus F star, the, the global optimum, will be written like this. 
for some some of square of the of certain degree at your step D of your hierarchy. Now, if you differentiate that, you will see that at the point x star, which is the global minimizer, the value of this sigma j of x star is exactly the Lagrange multiplier you see in the KKT condition. That the link with KKT condition. Okay, thank you. In the super resolution application, do you think it is possible to relax the uh, separation condition by going up in the uh, SOS hierarchy? I don't think so. And I think this is, uh, this is something that does not appear in Candace's paper. Uh, in Candace's paper, there, you, to retrieve your measure mu from those measurements, you need some uh, separation on the atoms. There is another method to solve this problem, which is called Prony method, which doesn't need any separation. But if you see the paper by Candace and Granda, they mention briefly this algebraic method. And they say, well, but this is not robust to noise. And they, they prefer to solve the SDP. But the SDP has a drawback that you, you certainly need this condition on separation, which is not needed in the in Prony method. And I think you cannot avoid it. In fact, it's, it's related to the fact that, you see? For super resolution, you will, you, will, you will look for, in the dual, you look for a polynomial, which is between minus one and one. And we touch as one at the, at the positive weights and touch minus one here. And if those points are very close, since your degree is fixed in advance of your polynomial, because it depends on the number of measurements, you can imagine that if the points are very close, you cannot go from minus one and one with a, with a fixed degree polynomial. It's impossible. That's the reason why you have this separation condition. In Prony method, you don't need this. So, knowing why the members of the audience with further questions to address Professor Seth during the break, now we thank the speaker again. Thank you.